everybody. Welcome to the New Market Alliance Church podcast. For more information on the vision, programs, and news of our church, be sure to check us out at www.newmarketalliance.ca. We'd like to encourage you as well that no podcast, no matter how good, can substitute for the experience of joining together in person at a worship celebration. That's where God really meets people, often through the love and ministry of others. At NAC, we meet every Sunday at 10 a.m. Now let's join this week's teaching. Welcome, everybody. Now, <clears throat> have you heard this? The Bible said it. I believe it. That settles it. Uh, that sounds easy until you actually read the Bible and you realize it's not always an easy book, is it? Like, let's just be honest. It's a collection of 66 very different books and letters and law and poetry and history and genealogies. And, uh, like, you cannot read Job, for instance, what we believe is the oldest book in the Bible, and come away with, like, an overly black and white view of the world. And the Apostle Paul himself wrote that Scripture is inspired by God, and yet it's clear that the Bible has human fingerprints all over it. The Bible is uh, perfection crammed with imperfect language and the otherworldly is expressed in worldly ways. Um, it's read by worldly eyes. It's processed by worldly brains. And so for as long as I can remember, the, the Christian response to difficult or even conflicting scripture has been to you know, try to smooth it over, uh, iron, out the, iron out the rough spots. It seems like the goal was to get everybody on the same page and, and come up with one consistent and comprehensive biblical worldview so that we can confidently proclaim that we know God's opinion on everything from politics to economics to science and sex. And then, you know, we'll have this book that's like an ultimate weapon. Um, like, don't tell me Christians don't make idols, idols out of paper and ink sometimes. It's why we have to come to Scripture so humbly and open-handedly and um, filled with the Holy Spirit. I wonder how many times we come to the Bible as just a way to, to look for evidence to back up our pre-existing worldview, right? Like, we'll reverse engineer the Bible to sort of justify our existing opinions. Are you saying, Jonathan, that you don't believe the text is inerrant? No, I'm saying that I don't think your interpretation is inerrant, or that my interpretation is inerrant. So in this series, we're confronted with some culturally difficult passages, leftovers from our, you thought 1 Corinthians series was done, best six months of your life. Uh, and here we are again. You know, I've, I realized fairly quickly that there's, there's some difficult passages there that needed uh, its own special study, and, and listen, I am not coming to this like the Bible answer man, okay? Let's open the passage together and humbly, open-mindedly, discerningly ask the Spirit of God to illuminate our, our hearts and minds, soften our hearts. So know this as well. I'm not even trying to advocate for a side or even, you know, answer the question other than how does this passage... Show us the more excellent way of love. And I'm going to keep coming back to that. So you may have noticed 1 Corinthians is an intensely um, realistic letter, isn't it? Like, this is not pie-in-the-sky theological white tower, uh, I've, white tower, ivory, <laughs> white castle. Uh, I could go for a white castle. Uh, focus, Jonathan. Ivory tower. <laughs> Stuff like this is this is stuff in the trenches. This is messy Christian stuff, and it acknowledges that Christians who live together with other Christians in community are going to have conflict sometimes. Right? It's going to get into disagreement. It's going to get messy, and so this is sometimes even of a litigious nature. Paul says, like as Christians, as a church like Knack, we we sometimes do business together. Which means, for example, I have used uh, realtors from my church. I've bought and sold 
cars from Christians. I've uh, more often than not hire tradespeople and mechanics, um, people who do home reno, who, who have attended the various churches that I've attended. How many would raise your hand and say, you, you use Christians to do business with? Yeah, of course. Um, this was the first year that I can remember where my taxes got more complicated than just a $40 software program, and I actually hired somebody from NAC. And so we, we, it's good to hire each other and help each other because if you've got a business or a skill or a talent or you know, you're a carpet layer and I need carpet, um, it's good for us to do business together for God's people. It can be a win-win all around. But what if something um, doesn't go right? What if somebody doesn't do a good job, doesn't follow through, doesn't meet expectations, doesn't complete the work, or you don't get paid for the work you did do? Like, like what then? Like, this is real rubber meets the road kind of real life stuff. How, how is a Christian supposed to respond to that when... When the relationship, the business relationship has gone south with another Christian. I mean, um, in the States, there has been this year between 80 and 90 million lawsuits filed. And 70% of the world's lawyers are in America. Now, Canada is different in many ways, not nearly as, as litigious, but this stuff creeps into the church. It, it happened in Paul's church in Corinth, where Christians were suing each other. You can imagine how awkward the, the church experience would be. Everybody gets together, and they're all tied up in litigation. You know, it's hard to be in a Bible study when it's like, hey, can you pray for my court case? And yeah, you pray for mine, too. I'm countersuing, and, uh, you know, i countersuing their countersues. Thank you, Jesus. So could we pray about that? It gets weird when the prayer meeting, when everybody... Uh, has a suit and a countersuit and then walking around with video cameras trying to get evidence on everybody. That's kind of what was going on in Corinth. And unfortunately, there are people in this room who know all too well um, sort of the heartbreak of lawsuits and being sued. You know, maybe you've come into a little bit of success and you suddenly become a target. Sometimes... Um, Sometimes they know that it's going to cost you a quarter million dollars to defend yourself, even if it's a frivolous lawsuit. And so they bet on settling for 100000 just to save money on court costs. And, and you know, these are the, the stuff you have to wrestle with when, when you're in a small business, you're an entrepreneur. And so the question is, when you have a financial or contractual conf conflict, with another Christian, particularly in the same church, how do you deal with it? How do you resolve it? And in this text, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 to 11, I, I think it has often been wrongly applied. So let's read it carefully. Let's, let's pay attention to the heart of what Paul's trying to say. First thing he says is that Christians within a church should try to resolve uh, disputable secondary matters between themselves, not rush off to court, okay? So verse 1, he says... If any of you has a dispute with one another, do you dare take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? I like how the King James Version says it, but before the saints? First thing, um, <clears throat> you know, you and another Christian are in the church, you have sort of a disagreement um, of a business nature. And before you run off to the non-Christian judge and go, what would Jesus do? Like, try to work it out. Together, the two of you should try to bring it before the saints. Now, when I say saints, how many of you are thinking, well, aren't those a bunch of dead guys? Aha, you were raised Catholic, right? <laughs> when the Bible uses the word saint, it just means somebody who loves Jesus, right? So let's say there's a guy named Hank, and he's a plumber, and he loves Jesus. Saint Hank, the patron saint of plumbing. And he's wise, and he's mature, and he's impartial, and he agrees to get in the middle of this mess and, and help sort it out. We don't need a judge. P Plumber St. Hank is going to do fine. So do you not know that the saints will judge the world at the end? Did you know that you and I and Hank are going to 
work with Jesus to judge the world? He says, and if you are to judge the world, are you not confident to judge trivial cases? Now, we're going to hang on a lot on that word trivial, okay? We'll come back to that. But in the reading of this, don't miss sort of that caveat, that clause, that it changes things. So we need to pay, uh, pay special attention to trivial. Do you not know that we will judge the angels? That'll be cool. Judging the angels and the demons will judge them as well at the end of time. How much more the things of this life, therefore? If you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? Look, um, they don't need to be a professional attorney. They need to love the Lord, have a sense of justice, um, impartiality, biblical knowledge maybe, filled with the Holy Spirit, perhaps rank high in the spiritual gift of, of wisdom and discernment, and that should be enough. And Paul says, I say this to shame you. Previously in the, in the letter, he says, I don't mean to shame you. Here he says, I definitely mean to shame you. What you're doing is shameful. You should be ashamed of yourselves. Is it possible there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? Ouch. Part of the problem in the church is that, you know, there were a bunch of arrogant people, and they think they're really wise. And on this count, Paul says, well, if there's some dispute, if you're all so smart and wise, can't you untangle a few conflicted knots? I mean, can't you settle a few cases between people? Well, let me back up and summarize, I think, what Paul's saying. First thing is that a Christian and a Christian, they have a conflict if it's a disputable secondary matter, a, tr a trivial matter, they shouldn't rush off to court. They should agree on a third-party mediator to come in between them, work out the difference. You know, the court systems actually use arbitrators and, and mediators, and Christians should do the same. And so there's, there's even mediation groups that work exclusively with, with Christians who do this. It's simple, it's, it's clean, it's arbitrated, it's mediated as much as possible. Um, and then legally, you might, you might call these civil matters. I'll give you an example. Um, you're doing a real estate transaction with somebody in your church. Uh, you're selling them a home. You're cutting them a good deal because you love them. You're trying to help them get relocated. But after the deal goes through, they don't pay you everything that they said they would. What do you do about that? Well, Jesus actually lays out a process in Matthew 18 on how to deal with offense and confrontation. It's such a standard operating procedure in the Christian world. You might even hear someone say, well, did you Matthew 18 it? Which is basically, did you approach that person first, personally, before you, know, you go behind the scenes and start gossiping about them? And if that still doesn't resolve things, you're to meet again, except you try to bring some wise Christian witnesses. And if that doesn't work, there's a next step of bringing it before church leadership. You know, but it's funny how many people skip the first step. Well, have you talked to that person? Well, no, but I think you shouldn't. But, 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 but don't talk to me first. Like, don't tell me the gossip. Talk to them. And, uh, well... Let's say you go through those steps, and not all of Matthew 18 necessarily applies here, because perhaps both of you feel that you've been wronged. So Paul has some suggestions. You bring somebody else in who's godly, and you say, look, do we both agree uh, to give them our case, and then agree that we'll do what they tell us, whatever wisdom they have at the end of this? So yeah, so you bring in a godly real estate agent or a mortgage broker or, or somebody in finance, somebody who understands these things, and you let them look at the facts, and they make a judgment. And you say, okay, it's imperfect, but we'll live with that. I know of people in this church who have utilized this very scriptural precedent, and it's hard, and it's imperfect, but it works. So maybe, maybe somebody 
I don't know, sells you a car and they say, yeah, it's a good runner. I promise you if anything happens in the first three months, I'll cover it. I just, I just want you to feel good about it. You drive it away and it blows up. And you go back and say, hey, your car blew up. And they're like, psych, you shouldn't have bought a Ford Pinto anyways. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, but you gave me your word. So we need to get a mediator. You bring in your small group leader. You bring in somebody godly to mediate this difference. Now, it may not feel like it at the time, but in the scheme of things, these are what we call trivial matters. Um, I, know it, I know it doesn't feel like it when you're talking about finances in your car, and, but most of the church's conflicts are trivial matters. Now, weighty matters, totally different story. Spousal abuse, uh, laundering money, ISIS, okay? Different story. Like if you come home and your roommate is cooking meth and got a big poster of I heart Osama bin Laden and there's a lot of ticking going on in your room, like don't call your Bible study leader, okay? Um, Susie, I think he's an ISIS. We should pray about... No, call like somebody with a badge and a gun, okay? Uh, now that's a weirdly extreme example, but... In the church, <laughs> I mean, there are certain things we should just punt on, like terrorism. Uh, Paul's talking about smaller matters here. And most of the time among Christians and in the culture at large, it's actually the smaller matters that end up jamming the court's time. That being said, he's saying that initially Christians should try to resolve their differences among one another in a respectable, honorable non-secular court kind of way. But let me give some clarifying points on what Paul's not saying. Okay, here's what he's not saying. Understand um, the church as a governing body tends to deal with sins, not crimes, okay? And this is an important that you understand this distinction. Rape, abuse, fraud, theft, those are criminal activities. And if a crime is committed, you call the proper authorities. If a sin is committed, um, they won't come. <laughs> if you call 911 and it's like, I'm being gossiped about, could you get over somebody over here, stat? They'll be very unhappy with you. You learn that out the hard way, it turns out. And uh, there's no police or court that wants to deal with, you know, adultery or porn addiction or selfishness because those aren't crimes, they're sins, right? So a lot of things only fit the church because what we deal with is sins. Other things fit the courts because they're crimes, and you've got to distinguish those because, look, there are heartbreaking stories of churches who either willfully or stupidly misinterpret these verses to cover up crimes by dealing with them in-house, and I mean, it's shocking. Like, you know the stories, but um, so-called Christians who continue to victimize because it's kept in-house, they, they move them to another parish, they quit their job but go work somewhere else at another church, they end up doing what? Victimizing more people. And so in these cases, it should never be about covering up for Christians. It's about protecting victims. Amen? And so God is a God of justice. He doesn't, he doesn't want us to cover up crimes. I've seen some churches, in the name of protecting their own, actually harbor sexual offenders and um, those who hurt children that in no way should be protected. They should be handed over to the proper authorities because the victims need help, the children need counseling, the families need to be informed. And I, I think... I think confidentiality in a lot of churches is a, is a misused concept. I don't, I don't care what movie you saw that you think there is some clergy client privilege of secrecy. Um, if you come in and say, I'm doing something really bad, you can keep a secret, right? No, we don't keep those kinds of secrets. And if you say, um, I've harmed children, we're not going to keep that a secret. If you come in and say, I'm stalking a woman in the church, like, we're telling her. 
Um, I, that's just the way it has to be. And so if you cheat on your spouse, we're going to lead you into a path of full disclosure. Hopefully it comes from you. Hopefully there can be some sort of reconciliation, but we're not going to be your secret keepers, okay? We're not going to be the sweepers under the rug. There, there are more important issues at stake than your reputation. Justice is at stake. And so if you're hitting your wife, I'm telling. I, I mean, I don't mean to make light of it either, but churches need to be extra transparent, extra accountable. Well, you can't do that. You're a pastor. You're supposed to be confidential. Well, no, I'm your wife's pastor as well, and, and nothing, nothing ever good has come from keeping in the darkness what was meant to be brought into the light. And so sometimes Christians love to play this game where they come in and they, they dump their stuff on other Christians and then want to be, you know, want them to be sort of accomplices through their silence. And meanwhile, they're thinking, oh, that felt good to get that off my chest, you know. I said it to somebody. That's enough, right? It's an issue that has touched our family directly uh, at a previous church where Vicky had to make a real integrity decision. And it's always the harder decision, right? Romans 13 says, you obey the government that God has put in place. If there's a child abuse, if there's molestation, if a crime has been committed, we're going to notify the authorities and obey the government. God, God works through the government as well. Now, this clause in 1 Corinthians 6, it doesn't forbid Christians from suing non-Christians. I've seen this sometimes. You know, you, you hire a non-Christian to work on your house. Uh, they tear the roof off and then disappear with your money. And you're looking up through your roof, and you're going, well, I, you know, I'll be able to see the Lord first when he returns, <laughs> but I'm also uh, getting wet right now, and that's, that's no good. And, you know, you go to the courts, and they say, well, you can't sue me. You're a Christian. Well, yeah, but I don't have a roof. And after 12 phone calls and six letters, like, sometimes you have to do it. You're being ripped off and you're being taken advantage of, and somebody has reneged on a deal. You went into a business partnership with somebody who's not a Christian, and they took money, or they did great damage. They, they have broken a contract. You, you may discern that you need to pursue legal recourse, absolutely. For those who um, you read Christianity Today or keep in touch with this sort of insider evangelical church stuff. You know recently of a megachurch pastor who sued a Christian journalist because they were discovering things about him behind the scenes, and uh, that is not good application of this principle because it turns out those things were correct, and that lawsuit was a way to intimidate. And so this does not mean also that if, you, if a non-Christian sues you, that you can't defend yourself. Like, are you at fault? No, I think they're trying to squeeze me for money. Well then, lawyer up, because if the word got out, hey, let's just sue Christians because they don't get attorneys because they don't go to court, like that would not go so good for us, right? Like we'd be getting sued all the time. And so that would lead to injustice, and our God is a God of justice. So. His first point is, I think, essentially, if there's a Christian in the church on a secondary, disputable, trivial, more minor case or infraction, deal with it in-house. See, there's something that Christians have to um, filter every decision on um, that non-Christians don't. We need to be asking ourselves when we make decisions, questions like this, what is best, what is in the best interest of the gospel? Um, how will this reflect on Jesus and his church? It says in verse 6, but instead one brother goes to court against another, a Christian suing another Christian. And this is in front of unbelievers. Paul's indignant. Paul says it's not a good witness. You got Deacon Dan and small group leader Sally, and they go to court, and they're cussing each other, fighting, pulling hair. It ends up on Jerry Springer. It's a mess. And the non-Christians are like, if this is church life, like, keep it. 
um, that's a bad witness. It's Christians just maligning one another, and, and the non-Christian has to get in there and sort out the mess. Paul says, man, that, that is not a good witness. He says, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have already been completely defeated. Why not rather be wrong? Why not be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong. And you do this to your brothers, to your sisters who are other Christians. Like, who's asking the question, at what cost do I pursue this, you know? I don't even mean financially, but what will this do to my relationships with other Christians? What will this do to my witness for the gospel? What will this do to our church? Um, How will this uh, impact the name of Jesus? How will this appear outside of our church to non-Christian friends and family and media, whomever might be involved? And again, uh, you never use that as some excuse to, to let crimes or abuse happen. But in these trivial matters, sometimes you have to ask the question, is this ultimately worth it? I bet you... Um, I bet you there may be times where you have to say, you know what, Um, the best thing for the name of Jesus is to take this to court because crimes have been committed. Justice needs to come. Um, People need to stand up for what is right. Can you think of a historical example even? I can. How about slavery? where a lot of Christians stood up and said, morally, legally, in every way, slavery is wrong, and we're going we're gonna to fight for change. Um, that was a good demonstration of the love of Jesus. So, so sometimes going to court is the best way to show the loving justice of Jesus. And I'll bet there are folks, maybe even in this room, who after weighing the pros and cons, not just the financial, but the the relational aspect, the reputational aspect, the theological aspect, at the end of the day, you say, you know what, I'm just going to eat it. Like, um, there's been occasions where you've, you've eaten some dollars and it doesn't go down very easy, but you say, for the sake of wisdom, this just ain't the battle. This ain't the hill I'm going to die on. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay because at the end of the day, that friendship, that reputation of Jesus, the well-being of the church, that's more important in some cases. Not all, but in some. So it's, it's a prayerful, careful issue of discernment, isn't it? There's no like one size fits all in this. You know, one other point. Christians, um, ultimately, we accept that this is a fallen, sinful world. Things are wrong. Things go bad. And, and, and you're not going to get perfect justice um, because nobody's omniscient. Um, judges don't know everything like God. Nobody's completely impartial like God. Nobody's fully just like God. So whether it's an arbitrator or mediator or church discipline case or secular court, there's going to be occasions, sadly, of injustice. So, so what do you do? You wait for the day at the end where Jesus calls it all like it is and straightens it out and makes straight all the paths that have, are crooked. And you finally get your day in court. You remember what Rebecca said in her testimony? I'm going to let Jesus sort that out. And sometimes that's all you can do. He goes on in verse 9. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Here's what he's saying. If someone keeps sinning, like don't worry, there will come a day when justice will be doled out. Yeah, but it looks like right now they're getting away with it. That crime does pay. That injustice does prevail. Nope. Not forever. Maybe in this life, but not forever. Um, There'll be a reckoning before Jesus, our perfect judge. So, may we be the first to apologize to people. May we be the first to initiate 
reconciliation, to ask for forgiveness. Um, and occasionally, occasionally when people rip us off or take advantage of us, we, um, we might even discern that that's a time where we would take the loss, so to speak. And we can say when they ask, like, why did you do that? We can say it's grace. God's been gracious to me. I'm going to be gracious to you. I could take you to court. I could sue you. I could make your life miserable. But here's what you get instead. Grace. I forgive you. I love you. I care more about you than this issue. And I don't want anything to get between you and Jesus. So I'm going to, I'm going to take the hit on this one. And I'm going to love you. And I'm going to let it go. And we just might be giving room for God to work in people's hearts and lives. And it doesn't mean that we never pursue litigation. It doesn't mean that we never pursue justice. Sometimes we gotta. But we're always thinking, what is going to help people see Jesus? Sometimes it's justice. Sometimes it's forgiving, grace, long-suffering, mercy. Because Paul says that's what some of us were. We were all in our sin. And Jesus loved us and saved us. And when we meet people that are in their sin, we need to love them in the hopes that Jesus will save them. And he goes on to say as we close, but you were washed, cleaned up. Jesus took away all your filth. You were sanctified. That's a fancy word for you have this ongoing life of relationship with Jesus where he keeps working on you uh, because we're all a work in, in process. You were justified. You were declared righteous in the eyes of God by the substitutionary death of our Lord Jesus Christ. You were made friends with God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That all happens through Jesus who sends the Holy Spirit to dwell in us and empower us, enables us to say no to sin, say yes to God, to live a life of repentance, transformed, changed so that we know we're not perfect but we are day by day becoming more like jesus folks what's, what was the point of today did we just spend half hour at church having a tutorial on when to sue and when not to sue is this seriously about the abuse of the court system i just want to submit to you that there's a bigger point here i think paul might be alluding to something if if the christians in the church are so mired in their conflict with each other, then, then clearly they've lost sight of their mission. Um, and what he's reminding them is this, that if you need courts and judges and cops and prisons and attorneys and restraining orders, there's a good chance you may have lost sight of your mission. And, you know, maybe we do need more cops and prisons and social workers and group homes and, and battered women's shelters. We need more rehab clinics, maybe. And all that might be true, but you know what I think we really need more of? More spirit-filled Christians. Um, that's what we need. That's, that's what really could change this world. I believe that. So, so if you're a person who puts a Christian fish on your business card then do your job really well. Um, deliver results on time. Uh, don't overbuild. Don't take advantage. Don't, don't take advantage of the fact that someone hired you because they thought you were a Christian. You know, they gave you a measure of trust. And, and if you go out for dinner after church today and you sit at a booth and you take it up for two hours and you're thanking Jesus and you're closing your eyes and you're praying and dissecting the service and talking about how much, you know, how cute our pastor is and how awesome his messages are. And, well, you know what? When you leave, tip well, okay? Because the culture is going, okay, these Christians roll in here after Sunday and they take up a booth for 90 minutes and they leave a tract that says, here's a tip, look into Jesus, true story. The city is looking, and they're not really looking at our doctrinal statement. They're looking at our life, right? And they say, well, do I want to be like you or not? Are you a good neighbor? Or do you love me? Do you deal 
in honesty and integrity. Be about the work of the gospel. Some of you here today and you've lost money, you've lost a job, you've lost a promotion, you've been mistreated. And you know what? You haven't responded to evil with evil. You haven't sought revenge. And I know how difficult that is. I want you to be encouraged because like Jesus, Jesus was lied about. Jesus was taken advantage of. Jesus was murdered. And he didn't defend himself. He didn't get an attorney. And maybe in the name of Jesus, you're acting a little bit like Jesus in this situation. And you suffer a little bit, perhaps for the cause of Christ. And that's an honorable thing. That's an honorable thing. Build your life on Christ this morning. Will you pray with me? Jesus, I want to thank you for this very practical, simple word about living life together as the Christian church in community. And Jesus, I pray we would take care of each other. I pray there wouldn't be division. I pray when inevitable conflict comes, we would deal with it in a mature, godly way. May we consider the reputation of our church and of our Lord Jesus in this city. And I pray, God, that as others look at us, how we conduct our business, our relationship, our finances, our compassion, that they would see people who are led by the Holy Spirit. And so may our city see Jesus in your people and what he's done to change them. We ask that in your strong and powerful name. Amen. Will you stand with me?